October 2007 at the age of 43. If lucky Philip Duby were to be alive today, he would be 53 years old. He was a legend and, of course, a soldier. May God rest the soul of the departed. Good morning to you and you're welcome to Viewpoint. Before we get into Viewpoint, we have a quick announcement. Please listen to this announcement. Exactly 10 years ago, we lost a rare gem, a father, a brother, a son, and uncle, ASP Isaac Oluwale Ajefele. He was a gallant officer of the Nigeria police who answered the final call on Saturday, the 3rd of August, 2017. Zhu lived a selfless life. You simply lived for others. It's been 10 agonizing years since you departed, but we take solace and the fact that you left a legacy that trails in your shadow. We know that death is just too final to be an object of gamble. Your death dealt us a devastating blow, but we take solace in the fact that you're in a better place. Continue to rest in peace. Survived by Tunji Ayefele and Dotun Ayefele announcer Dr. Yinka Ayefele for the family. Good morning to you once again and welcome to Viewpoint. The International Monetary Fund has predicted that the Nigerian economy will be out of recession this year with growth of 0.8%, though it says risks to the recovery remain high. The IMF, however, said the growth would not be sufficient to reduce unemployment and poverty in the country. The IMF staff team, led by Senior Resident Representative and Mission Chief for Nigeria, Mr. Amini Mati, visited the country from July 20th to the 31st to discuss recent economic and financial developments, update macroeconomic projections, and also to review reform implementation. According to Mati, the economic backdrop remains challenging. Despite some signs of relief in the first half of 2017, he said, Following four quarters of negative growth, the non-oil economy grew by 0.6% year-on-year on the back of a rebound in manufacturing and continued strong performance in agriculture. He stated that various indicators suggested an uptick in activity in the second quarter of the year, adding that the headline inflation, which decreased to 16.1% in June, remained high despite tight liquidity conditions. Matty said preliminary data for the first half of the year indicates significant revenue shortfalls, with the interest payments to revenue ratio remaining as high as 40% at the end of June and projected to increase further under current policies. High domestic bond yield and tight liquidity continue to crowd out private sector credit. He says, given Nigeria's low growth environment and the banking system's exposure to the oil and gas sector, Non-performing loans increased from 6% in 2015 to 15% in March 2017, 8% after excluding the four undercapitalized banks. Marty added, however, uh, near-term vulnerabilities and risks to economic recovery and macroeconomic and financial stability remain elevated. Marty identified concerns about delay in policy implementation, a reversal of favorable external market conditions, possible shortfalls in agricultural and oil production, additional fiscal pressures, continued market segmentation in a foreign exchange market that remains dependent on central bank interventions and banking system fragilities all represent the main risks to the outlook. According to him, in the near term, a stronger push for front-loaded fiscal consolidation through a sustainable increase in null oil revenue will be needed to create space for infrastructural spending, social protection, and private sector credit. He said this should be simultaneously accompanied by a monetary policy that avoids direct financing of the government and is kept sufficiently tight 
a unified and market-based exchange rate and rapid implementation of structure. Pursuing these policies, he says, will help reduce macroeconomic vulnerabilities and create an environment for a diversified private sector-led economy. We cannot overemphasize the desirability, I mean, the imperative of a private sector economy for Nigeria. Again, the bulk of government revenue should come from tax revenues accruing to government. When and if the bulk of government revenue is taxed, government will have no choice but to ensure the viability of its source of funding by thinking hard to enact favorable policies to and for the private sector. Private sector friendly policies would of course boost production, employment and ultimately help the banks to create more money. The seeming growth we are seeing in our economy today is intrinsically linked to the following one. Nigeria's current production of oil, which is about 2.7 million barrels of oil per day. Two, last week, crude oil rallied the most so far this year, gaining more than 8% or you could say $4 per barrel. Today, the price of crude is about $49 per barrel. The 2017 budget was predicated on oil production of 2.2 million barrels per day and $42 per barrel. And if we're producing 2.7 million barrels and the price of oil is $49, then it looks good, right? It's therefore no surprise that Nigeria's reserves is up to $30 billion. So the economy looks good, it must look good as it seemingly gains momentum. The question would therefore be, why does IMF think this growth is fragile and risky? And why is this economic growth not translating to a reduction in unemployment and poverty? Government is the one making the money from its oil sales. Yes, crumbs of the gains trickle down in government spending. Unfortunately, government spending in Nigeria isn't the economically profitable kind of government spending that leads to macroeconomic growth. Government spending in Nigeria is largely channeled into consumption in terms of salaries, pensions, allowances, white elephant projects, debt servicing, etc. etc. Government's ability to spend intricately linked to oil revenue is contingent on stability of oil production and oil price. While OPEC is moving to cap Nigeria's oil production, Niger Delta militants have threatened to commence bombing of pipelines by the 31st of September. These and other factors make Nigeria's oil predicated economic growth fragile and laden with risk. Question 2. Why is the economic growth not translating to a reduction in unemployment and poverty? Well, the seeming growth is oil money predicated growth, not growth due to foreign investment inflows. That too is threatened and discouraged by embarrassingly uninspiring security guarantees. Not growth due to private sector lending to government. Not growth due to infrastructure revolution. The growth looks more like the bubble it has always been. Volatility of oil price or threatened production could burst the bubble anytime. It is fragile as it is risky. Professor Oshimba just so far achieved the respite in hostilities in the Niger Delta. He also wrestled the Naira back to life from what looked like a hopeless tumble. With Oshimbajo in the saddle, all hope is not lost. 10 13. This is Viewpoint. Abimbola Olowu, better known as BYZ, joins me on the program. Good morning. Good morning, Tokwe. And um, while you were going out with uh, you know, that report, I couldn't mm. just agree more. That's the situation we have. We find ourselves right now. Yes, uh, we just pray that we don't get to. We don't get back to points where we'll have to struggle with um, the militants, and mm. um, you know, obviously we know what it's that's going to translate into mm. having to struggle with foreign exchange. Again. 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 We hope so. Uh, well, you're welcome to the program again. It's always good to see you. Thank you so much. Today on a Viewpoint, a real, real pleasure. We're talking about restructuring. Our guest today thinks the much talked about restructuring is being reduced to a mere slogan, beaten and used and already shredded 
a term flung back and forth so much it's beginning to mean next to nothing a mere slogan he worries that nigeria would never be restructured under the subsisting circumstances former ambassador to the philippines ambassador jemi farombi you're welcome to our program thank you so much it's nice being with you you're welcome sir good morning sir it's good to see you again, sir. We have seen different clamors for change in this country. At different times, there was the clamor for Biafra, which left about 100,000 overall military casualties in our history, while between 500,000 and 2 million Biafran civilians died from starvation. That's an agitation. The Niger Delta Avengers called for resource control and restructuring. This agitation nearly brought the economy to its knees. Arewa youths want the Igbo out of their line by the 1st of October. At some point, we wanted Jonathan to go. Before we begin to interrogate the content of the call for restructuring, sir, why is the call for restructuring gaining a momentum at yeah. this time? Yeah. In the natural situation in Nigeria, once there is a problem with the economy, when well, there is a problem with or poverty, when there is a problem of providing food for people, when there is the inability of parents to pay their fees, the inability of Nigerians to find the same good housing, once the economy squeezes them, then they become dissatisfied and then they go into slogans. Uh, if it is not solely national conference, then it will be true federalism. If it is not true federalism, it will be resource control. If it is not resource control, it will be restructuring. Anytime Nigerians find themselves in a doldrum economically, then they're going to begin to talk. They're going to begin to agitate. They're going to begin uh, to express themselves, to show... Um, that what the Marxists say is basically true. When there is a problem with the economic foundation of any society, then other cleavages will come. Ethnic, religious, social, moral cleavages will come. They are always product of economic problems. So if you listen to what Tope had said about an economy that is growing but not developing, an economy that is not delivering benefits to the people, a rise in income that is not shown in the pockets of the people, a rise in uh, inflow of revenue that is not shown in, the, uh, in an increasing rate of employment. When you find that kind of economic situation, the people are going to find outlets. It is like a boiling um, kettle. It's, they're going to find outlet, and the outlet will either be, okay, if these people lived enough, perhaps it would be more convenient for us. If we break away uh, as it goes, perhaps we'll be able to Have find things better. easier. Or if the if we control our oil resources, uh, whether it's forty nine dollars or against forty two or it's two point seven against two point two, if we control it, then perhaps life will be better for all. It, it is basically because we have failed as a nation. We have failed to deliver on the promises. We have failed to utilize the resources that we have. The tremendous potential economic potentials and human potential and that is why periodically our people will agitate okay the call for um restructuring especially now when it's mentioned what really comes to mind is um uh, resource control devolution of power regional autonomy local government autonomy more states or merging of states do you think based on the this limitations this will solve our problems that's what i'm saying restructuring means nothing you see I mean? restructuring is just restructuring what do you want to gain what do you want to achieve what is the content what is the purpose what are the problems that you want to solve what are the problems facing nigeria you look at it you have resources that are not uh, rightly used 
you have human beings that are not rightly deployed, you have a frightening level of unemployed graduates in the streets, you have unemployment even of artisans. Bricklayers, carpenters, foremen, they are all employed. So you, you have to define what are your problems. So when you say restructuring, and you, to some people it means, oh yeah, let's go back to the regions. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's something we've had. Um, well, we had four, uh, we had, um, four regions then. Is that what we are going back to? If you take this, the then Western region, do you think that all the people in the then Western region want to come back to Ibadan? I read a very brilliant article by Ajibola Ogushola, the former chairman of um, Punch. And he said, he, he did some survey on the East, that apart from Enugu state, the, the indigenous of the other state do not want to go back to Enugu. Because they realized that without the creation of Ebonji, Abia, and all the other states, there will have been no development outside Enugu. And if you tell the Oshu state man or the Adwekiti man to come back to Ibadan, it's going to tell you that without Adu, without Ekiti state, Adwekiti won't be what it is today. And that all these states are the centers of development. So if you think that because there used to be a western region, there was used to be a northern region that is today 19 states, that you get them back, it is a lie. It will not happen. And that is why you must define what you mean by restructuring. Sure. Okay. If you say it is true federalism, true federalism does not necessarily mean you must go back to region. True federalism, if you go back to the elementary principle, the definition by KC mm. Weir, it says there must be a coordinated relationship between the center and the federated units. Yes, yeah, the federated units could be called regions, they could mm. be called states, they could be called provinces. What is important is that the relationship between them must be coordinated and equal. These federated units must not be subservient. They must not be subsidiary to mm. the center as they are in Nigeria. Nigeria yeah. And if that is what you want to solve, then say it clearly. <laughs> so there will be no argument. <laughs> it, it won't matter whether you are in Kanuri huh. or you are in Adwekiti or you are in uh, Abia. You know that it is something that will be beneficial to all of us. What you are saying is, why must a state go to the center to get power? Mm. Why must a state go to the center to get water? Why must my local government in effect, Iowa in Osho State, be subjected to the same minimum wage as Lagos Island? These mm. are issues. From, from, from the way people are clamoring and talking and asking for restructuring, which uh, has led to the momentum in the call for restructuring. So what are you hearing? What do the people mean by restructuring at this time? What are they saying? What is the content of this call for restructuring? You see, it depends on who you are talking to. Basically, in... Um, the later days of uh, IBB, where we started talking about sovereign national conference to lead to a restructured Nigeria, the position of the Southwest then, the leaders of the Southwest that met in Abel Kuta and the other was that, let's go back to the regions. Let's go back to parliamentary system. Let's go back to part-time uh, legislative system. So it was a return to the good old days as they remembered it under Papa Wolo or Papa Zikwe or Papa Sadauna. But of course things have changed. There have been so much agitated for state creation. And I know that there are about 80 states. As at the last national conference, that were being considered for creation. And if, if, if people still think they needed states, then if you're going to superintend over, uh, uh, over that a region, that you mean you have the center, you have the region, you have the state, you have the local government. Then you're going to spend all your money on administrative uh, services, salaries. 
The last budget that Papa Oro made in Western Region, which was 1959 budget, had 85% of, of it on capital and other charges. Only 15% was on salaries. That was the last budget he made in Western Region, 1959. There is no state that has that today. On the contrary, most states have perhaps 85% on salaries and pensions and other charges, and just perhaps 15% to do capital. Of course, when you spend all your money on services, then of course you cannot grow an economy, and that is the problem you are making. We, we had so much money. We, we, at a time in this country, we were selling uh, 2 million barrels per day at about $115. What happened? The money went into salaries, inflated salaries, and of course, maybe some inflated contracts. But our money is not dedicated to capital growth. It's not dedicated to the growth of, say, the small scale industries. My studies across the world shows that in America, 54% of the gross domestic product come from small industries that employ 5 to 10 people. Mm. Similar in, in Japan. But these are the things we don't invest money in. Of course, you cannot invest money in small scale industry if you do not have power. If your power production has remained at about 4,000 megawatts all these years, Singapore has a population of 4 million people. It produces 4 million megawatts of power. That's what we are competing with. And why, if you do not have power, then you cannot have the small scale industries. If you do not have the small scale industry, it means that the agro products, the agricultural product that could have been the basis for small scale industries, other than in processing, in preservation, so that you can even export them, you are unable to do that. It also means that there's so many people that you have been training and you sent to universities and polytechnics and they are adequately trained, they cannot use their brain because there's no power to power such SMEs. So we, we keep on having this problem of an economy that is buoyant in terms of inflow of money that we have not worked for. Now, let us compare this with the First Republic. Oh, the money came from cocoa. The people worked on cocoa farms. That was a value added by the people. The money came from granite. oil, it came from cotton. It came from palm oil, it came from palm kernel, it came from rubber. So the people worked for the money. When the prices of cocoa or rubber or granite is high in the world market, then the people earned the money into their own pocket. The government got a rent through the marketing board. But in this case, the Chevron, the Shell, the Total, they go into production of oil. They make the money. They, when it is high in the world market, they make the money. When it is low in the world market, market we make they make, they the, make money. the money we as nigerians are added no value nothing comes directly to our yes. pocket the rent comes to government whereas in the earlier days the money comes to the people's pocket and the government gets rent they beat cocoa house they beat university they beat study from such money but this one the money the only segment of the money that comes to nigeria ends up in government's pockets so the people are not beneficiary because we are not, we've not added as Nigerians anything, no value to the whole process. Okay. Um, don't you think this could actually be part of the reasons why people feel, yes, we want to decentralize the government? Called it restructuring as well. I, I know that um, it's kind of clumsy when people just come out to say we want Nigeria to be restructured without clearly defining 
the kind of restructuring they need. It could be political, it could be economical, it could be social. I mean, we know that um, restructuring is not really something new. It's been on forever. We had it um, um, during um, the military dictatorship, like you also mentioned, that Agui Rosi of um, 1966, when the country became um, a unitary kind of government. So if we think resources or money is so much at the central and the states are being deprived of what ought to come to them isn't it right of some of these people that feels okay let's restructure let's have um let's get back to, if we cannot have regional autonomy why not states actually you're very right what some of us are saying is let us define the restructuring we, are we want about. okay then you will find that we all Almost. agreed on it okay if we all believe there's so much money in the center as of today is 52.75 percent of the total resources of nigeria that is in the center and 25 one government mm. and 25 percent for 36 states and, and 24 percent for local for 774 local, local governments. governments obviously this is wrongly skewed money should be nearer the people where the job is that is where you have to build roads, you have to build hospitals, you have to build dispensaries, you have to build schools. So the money ought to be there. So a target of our instruction might should be, let us review the allocation of funds such that the federated units, today they are the states, we have more money. The last national conference said, give the states now 35% instead of 25%, and give federal 42 instead of 52 and still keep this local government, I think, at 22 or so. If you were to do that, it will matter whether you are Yoruba or Kanuri or Igbo or Hausa. It will mean that your state will have more money to do development up, uh, projects, projects in your state. So this is what we should do. We should define. So if, if we take the revenue, uh, allocation as one. Then we can look at, I've talked about power. We can look at power generation. Why is it that we have problem? Because there is only one person that can do power generation here is the center. Isn't it because the center is overburden, too much work? Why must it cater for one million square kilometers of people? Why don't we decentralize the power? So take the, uh, the, the, the power for generating electricity. Say, okay, center and the state or even a combination of the state you could take security that same way you could take railway that same way you to, you 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 could take basic important sector of the economy and look at it that way and then you will find that it won't matter whether you are yoruba or also and so on so people won't think that oh restructuring is this uh, yoruba craze they've come again no it is something that will benefit everybody if you just take time to define it because as essentially what are we worried about we want the lives of nigerians to be better we want to improve their lives we don't have want to have children who will leave schools and not have jobs we don't even then want them to be looking for a job we want them to be able to create jobs for themselves we don't want to have a situation in, in which if you are looking for the best plumbers and the best carpenter, you have to go to Togo. We don't want that kind of situation. So how do you do it? So you use the states and the local government as centers of economic development, economic development and economic growth. So it won't matter whether you are Yoruba or Hausa or Fulani. If this is achieved, your own local government will take care of you. Your own state will take care of you. So in a, a lot of misconception is because we, we love slogans. Mm. Oh, restructuring. And restructuring is like chameleon now. It depends on which color is near it. So you don't even know what it means. But restructuring, definitely we need in this country and we should look at it. Part of restructuring might be, why well, we so spending so much on legislative. Um, functions. Oh, they earn it so much. They have constituency projects. They have constituency offices. 
oh, why can't we do it in another way? We know that is the way it is done in U.S., but U.S. has the kind of resources that we don't have and we are not likely to have. Australia is also a federation, Canada is a federation, India is a federation, Switzerland is a federation. None of them has opted for the typical American system. So why don't we say that uh, our legislature will be part-time to reduce cost, to make more money available? And all this uh, noise about so much fraud, so much corruption at the center will be reduced. And it will not be benefiting only one section of the economy, it will be benefiting everybody, everybody. Uh, in this uh, country. And when you do that, then you are going to have another improvement because they, there is something that bothers everybody. They don't know how to say it. It is the way we recruit people into political position. The caliber of people that become councillors, that become chairmen, that become commissioners, ministers, honorable members, governors, and the president. Uh, it, it, because we have a monetized economy, a monetized political system, we find that only those who have money can okay. contest for this position. I was going to get to that, sir. But um, very quickly, you talked about um, uh, mention parts of uh, the resolution of from the 2014 CONFAB. Do you think the present administration needs to take a look at that report i believe that this government promised a restructure in its manifesto and without defining what it meant by restructuring just like what he didn't define what it meant by in his fight against uh, Boko Haram. He didn't define what it would do with the economy. He didn't define what it would do with corruption. But of course, because people were sat dissatisfied with the PDP administration or that Jonathan, anything but Jonathan was good enough. So they, they got away with Blue Mother. They, 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 they offered us slogan, we will fight corruption, we will think with the economy. We we'll bring we'll, change. We we'll bring change. We didn't ask what is the content and the direction of change, but we were sufficiently dissatisfied with what we had that we really didn't Any care. Any option was good. So they, they also offered uh, restructuring. And, and in my view, any government that is the government of the people, that is dedicated to serve the people, should look at all resources available to look at it. There had been a 1995 uh, CONFAB, there had been a 2005 CONFAB, there had been a 2014 CONFAB. They should look at them. And you'll find that there were similarities. There were areas, they were all agreed. And one of the areas they were all agreed is that there's too much power at the center. So you, you look at that. Two more resources at the center. So you look at that. Uh, that is devolution of power. They look at things like security. Why don't you have a state police and have this national police? They looked at that. I mean, there were areas that were common to all the reforms. So I, I think that this government, instead of convoking its own uh, conference, uh, because it's going to be a jamboree again, because we've had another three conferences that nothing came out of them, 1995, in my view, it was the 1995 CONFAB that brought the concept of six zones. And I remember that one of the paragraphs in, in the report said that the overburdening powers of the center must be dismantled, particularly in, in the areas of agriculture, education, health, works, and transport. And I agree. Because what is federal government doing with exportation of yams? What is their business with that? They don't, have, they don't own one acre of land in this country. Under the land use decree, the land belongs to the state. Mm. And they want to be involved in the marketing of uh, farming products. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's only in this country that the centre bothers about building houses. If you go to London, you, you look for council flats. Mm. You don't live in national flats. I mean, so 
these powers in housing, in agriculture, in health, in education should be of this body and given to the states and the local government and the resources to do them. They will find this in all the three confab reports. Hmm. They are all agreed on that. There's no dispute about that. So I think they should look at 2014 as a working paper, not as, oh, we must obey. You cannot even do all of them. There were over 600 uh, resolutions. Mm. I mean, you have less than two years left. You cannot mm. do that. And that was why I, I thought that the National Assembly can be more patriotic. They mm. can be more uh, responsive. Mm. They could look at it. They, they don't, it doesn't have to be presented to them. They could take the idea because mm. they can borrow ideas from wherever and they can put them together. Instead of looking at things as who appoints an auditor general, mm. who is going to uh, separate power between Minister of Justice and uh, mm. Attorney General, who becomes members of the Council of State. Those are not substantive issues that creative problems in this country. Mm. The thing's creative problem is that because there's too much power in the center, mm. everybody is fighting to be to get to the center. There's so much bitterness to get to the center. And when they get to the center, they have too much more, more money than sense. And so they, 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 they spend time stealing our money mm. rather than making the money available. Mm. But if we are to constitutionally reduce the powers of the center, even if it's not going to be like what it was under the 1963 constitution, mm. even if it's going to be something near it. I mean, they, 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 they will take care of foreign affairs, they take care of uh, national economy, they will take care of national defense, uh, currency, uh, issues like that that bind all of us together. Mm. And then they will give the powers so if, if, or, if or your state wants to spend more money on education, let it be free. If Plato state wants to spend more money on agriculture, let it be free to do so. Mm. Don't enforce a uniform rigidity mm. on a diversified country. So you, you, recommend, you recommend adoption of the CONFAB report, possibly as a working document. Yes. You also prescribed... Uh, an instrumental approach to restructuring takes it sector by sector and work on the sectors. This will require a lot of intellectual investment, capacity first, and then investment. I mean, it's an intellectual exercise. How confident are you in the ability of the crop of players we have in the legislature and in the executive to bring this plan possible plan to fruition the only one thing we lack is will and of course every time i look at nigeria i always remember what bashon abiola said in a guardian interview of february uh, 1993 he said very few people will want to dismantle their empire we don't have a gubashev in nigeria that is our problem Gubache was that Russia, uh, USSR president who dismantled USSR because he realized that it was not the best for all of them to remain the way they were. Clark was that white man who was prime minister, who was president in South Africa, who realized that if he didn't have a negotiated consensus with the blacks, that South Africa was going to crumble. And he conceded power and he stopped being president and became deputy president of Mandela. We do not have people who have the will. We do not have people who genuinely love this country. We do not have people who are committed to the, uh, the, the growth of the common man in this country. That is why we think so. I mean, they have the intellect, they have the ability, they, we have the universities, we have the graduate, we have the profession, and there are people who can provide the input. But the one thing we do not have is the will, the determination to make Nigeria better. Because we want to, to keep this class structure of us versus them, a minority of force controlling the resources of Nigeria and the majority of the people wallowing in poverty, wallowing in, in misery, wallowing in inadequacy. We think that is the best way. It is wrong because one day, those people who appear powerless, 
they become powerful. And when they become powerful, we won't like it. So I, I, I think that those in the legislators, of course, some of them, some of them came through corrupt ways. Some mm. of them are using corrupt money to buy political votes, to establish themselves politically. They are not likely to want to <laughs> dismantle the staircase they used. Mm. But I, I, I think if they sit down and look at the history of countries, at a particular point in time, a Gubashev will arise in Nigeria who will realize that, yes, I've gotten here not too legitimately, but I want to be remembered for posterity. I want to do things legitimately. So, so, so we can only hope I'm that not, that kind of person emerges. You know, when? Um, they, they, the, in science, for how long? Inside, there's something you call the force of inertia. When you have a big rock, or if you want to experiment, go and um, go and pack a trailer. When you pack the trailer, you, you give a shock for it. You put a handbrake, you put a shock to it, and go away for one hour. When you come there, you find that the trailer has moved. It will move. Nigeria is too big for it not to change. Whether we like it, or not. The forces of inertia, the energy of the youth, 60% of this population are 25 to 35. One day they are going to discover the enormity of the power, of the resources, of the strength in that number. And they are going to force this nation to move. If anybody thinks it will not happen, it's a joker. Through the ballot boxes? Yes. Through elections? Yes. Revolutionary elections. Because you, you, you're going to find that <laughs> it, it has happened in countries. Mm. You're going to find that it will become difficult for the corrupt man to put himself up because he will be unable to face the electorate in a campaign. You think it cannot happen. It will happen. I know that in this country in the past, if you have stolen money, and you go to a party and you sit in a table, people will avoid your table. I know today what will happen is that they will say babalere, babake to you. Mm, but it will not always continue that way. One day something is going to give up. The, 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 the people who have been exploited, the young graduates, you know how many of them? From just 250 universities, so many colleges of education, so many polytechnics and technical colleges, so many secondary schools, they, how they are not having jobs. Yes, you think they will always be happy with the rice and gari you give to their parents. You're going to, you, you're going to push people to a limit. You, you see, there's something I call the tolerance limit. Every society has a tolerance limit. I know societies where there have been a revolution because they increased the price of bread by about five shillings. In Nigeria, even when you increase the price of petrol by about 70 naira, there will be no revolution. You know what? We're class conscious people. You say, I can buy it. That man won't be able to buy it. Uh, isn't that why we say your generator may not pass your own? Be a class conscious. But it will not always continue like that. Because we, we, we are exposing a younger generation to inadequacies. And I thank you media people for what you do. And I try to list it to as many radio stations in the morning to, to see the kind of phone ins that you get from people. Then you know that the common man in the street is not sleeping, he's alert, he's mentally aware of some of these inadequacies and some of these chody deals. And one day, something will federate them. They will have a federation of poverty, a federation of inadequacy, and they will take their own destiny in their hand. What do you think, sir, about um, the, would I call it agitation as well, for restructuring? I know that especially from the South um, Niger Delta, yes, and even some part of South East, there has been this call for restructuring so much to the point that they say 
2019 might not happen if the country does not restructure. Fine, we've come to understand that um, the kind of restructuring we want is not what a lot of people are thinking. But what do you think the government needs to do between now and 2019 to at least make Nigerians understand that um, there's work in progress, the interests of the people is at heart, and um, Nigeria can still remain together. I'm not actually talking about my sub right now. Their own case is um, clearly a different one. What, what's your take, sir? In my own view, and I think in the better interest of Nigeria and in the better interest of this government, they ought to tackle that issue. Yes, I agree with the Vice President. Those who make hate calls should not. I, you know, I keep on using this word, negotiated consensus. In a federation, if I bow to you, you must bow to me. If you think that I must always bow to you, one day I'm going to fight you. There's nobody who must think that he's in, a, in an eminent position that everybody must bow to him. Or that he has a monopoly to rule, or he, he has a divine right to rule, or is that he's born to rule. So. Nobody should propagate it, but this government must be seen to be listening to the people. It doesn't matter whether we are saying the same thing, but everybody is talking about restructure this country. The vice president once said that we didn't need political restructuring, but what we needed was economic restructuring. I said, fine, good, let's do it. Let us even say that economic economy restructuring. Because there is no way you can do an economic restructuring without a political restructuring. The development of the Asi uh, Asian uh, giants was based on the political restructuring. The economy grew when they tinkled with their political system. So even if you want to restructure our economy, part of it, of course, will be that you decentralize the way we spend money. Part of it will, will be that you decentralize power on uh, power Isn't generation. Isn't restructuring itself a bit um, obje objective? I mean, or rather subjective. Um, because the clamor, if you look at it, some people feel we are the one responsible uh, for financing this country. If you, some feel we have the oil and we know that Nigeria is all dependent country. So if this clamor is coming from that part of the country isn't it just about uh, the available resources there if they feel oh if we have state autonomy then we have the power to manage what it uh, what belongs to us it is not shared by other members of the country you know honestly you won't hear air resource control in u.s and they produce more oil than we do Texas produces a lot of oil, and I don't think um, California cares what you do with your oil. They know they, they, they know what they can make from their film industry. And if you go a little bit, you know, in San Francisco, you know what you can make from your casinos. Everybody makes its own money. We know that uh, over 55% of uh, VAT in Nigeria is made a, from Lagos State alone. But that money is also take it to central pool and share it. Even by those who, who speak against things from which we make VAT. Hmm. They say don't drink beer. We make a lot of money from beer in terms of VAT, but they take a share of it. So it, 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 it's the same thing. Just that the South South thing, they're making money from um, petrol and crude oil. You see, if you leave everybody on it, if you decentralize the structure, you are going to find that people will rise up. They will rise up. In any case, the oil boom had become a doom for us. It, it created a race of lazy people. And as I explained the other time, we added no value to it. We had not any money for what we didn't do. And because we, it, it became a central source of financing, we left cocoa, we left uh, palm oil, we left Grand North, we left industrial development that we could have done. Our textile industries collapsed, our robot, our tire factories moved away to Ghana. We lost everything. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, sir. But I would want your lasting words for Nigerians. 
what do you think we need right now? Uh, a lot of people says in place of that restructuring, our problem is actually changing our mindsets. What would you, What I, I want you to give an advice in that direction before we wrap up on I the show. I agree because it's part of restructuring. You, you start everywhere. There's political, there's economy, there's social. We need a restructuring of our mind. What I call a renewal of ourselves, a renewal of our values, a renewal of our value system. Uh, which it is that will make sure that when you are in position, you don't steal the money. Mm. That the money meant for all of us, you don't appropriate it and use it for yourself alone. It, we need a change of mindset. We need a renewal of our values. You need a re we need to go to what we used to be mm. that made us our brother's keepers. I think that is also important. Former ambassador to the Philippines, Ambassador Yemi Farumbi, when will you get a shave, sir? When I started this beard in 1964, it was a signal of rebellion about what I called the decadent Nigeria then. I didn't mm. even know Nigeria was so good. And I said, <laughs> when Nigeria gets better, mm. I go shave. So make Nigeria better, and mm. you find that I'll be clean shaven. It's good to have you on our program this morning, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. God bless you. BYZ, thank you. Thank you so much. Folks, thank you for listening. That's it on F Viewpoint for today. Thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm.